All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Bodie Hodge. I've been working at the Ministry of Answers in Genesis for uh, over 15 years now. So I'm kind of like a staple. I've been here for a long time. I'm just uh, getting up there in, in my age now, it feels like. But I'm going to talk to you today about the subject of the Tower of Babel. And I'm going to look at some of the different fascinating aspects about the Tower of Babel. I'm also going to look at some of the cultural aspects. A lot of these will actually hit home. And so I really hope uh, you guys have a, have a great time with this particular talk. Well, what kind of attacks are there when it comes to the Tower of Babel? There's actually quite a few. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Genesis, Genesis comes under attack quite a bit, especially in today's culture. Uh, whether it's creation right there at the very beginning, whether it's the flood of Noah's day, we've seen a lot of attacks on that. But do you realize the Tower of Babel also comes under significant attack? Uh, just to give you an idea, some of these attacks, uh, the two that I'm going to hit in this particular talk is where people claim that the Tower of Babel is just mythology. It doesn't make sense of our world. Another aspect is the, the issue of racism in today's culture. Let's face it, racism is bad, isn't it? I mean, I've been in various parts of the world, and I've seen a lot of forms of racism, and it's a terrible thing. Now, as a Christian, I want to encourage Christians, hey, we should be the ones leading the fight against racism in our culture. And there's good reasons for that. Now, there's a host of other attacks, but I'm not going to go into all the detail of each one of those. But let's face it, there are people who are attacking the Tower of Babel. Uh, I hopped on the internet and I typed in the Tower of Babel. The very first link that came up was Wikipedia. For those of you who are familiar with Wikipedia, Wikipedia changes every day. It's somewhat uh, anti-Christian. But that was the very first link. You go to the very first line and what do they say? It's an origin myth. Right there, very first thing people would look up. You look up Encyclopedia Britannica online, look at this. They call it a mythological tower in Babylonia. I'm telling you, kids today... People today, all around, researchers, when they look up the Tower of Babel, the first thing they're hit with is, oh, this is just a myth. You can't trust that stuff. That's the kind of stuff that comes from the Bible and Genesis. Well, I'm here to tell you, the Bible can be trusted. It does make sense of the world. And I'm going to dive into this subject. The first thing I really want to dive into, though, is the issue of races and racism in our culture. We hear this term quite a bit, and I've had people say, oh, well, there's all these different races. Um, I've actually spoken in prisons, and I've had people try to tell me that there's a multitude of races. Hey, if we start with the Bible, and we all go back to Adam and Eve, how many races of mankind are there? One. We're not used to thinking that way, are we? You see, we've been conditioned by our culture to try to dive, divide people up into a multitude of different races by how they look, whether it's skin tone, whether it's hair, whether it's eye shape. Friends, I want us to step back and start with God and his word. There's one race, the human race. Acts 17, 26. Uh, this is Paul speaking, by the way. And he's speaking of God here. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. But I love this from one blood. We are all related. I look out at my audience right now. We're related. Whether you want to be related to me or not, we're related. Right? That's right. Amen, brother. <laughs> you see, we are one blood. But we're in a culture that has conditioned us to look a little different at that. And there's reasons for that. I'm going to dive into that here in a little bit. But see, I've had people say, well, why do people look so different? Why do we see all these, these different forms of human being? These people, with some people have darker skin than I do. Some people have lighter skin. People have darker hair. Some people have hair. <laughs> God love them. <laughs> but you see, we have variation, and there's a reason for it. You know, Adam and Eve looked a certain way. And after Adam and Eve, they had descendants, and their descendants did not look exactly like Adam and Eve. Go figure that one out. They, you know, they have variation within their children. That's expected uh, with their genes. You go all the way up, you have the bottleneck at the flood of Noah's day. Then you have Noah and his family come off the ark. The Lord told them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. What'd they do? They built a city and a tower and said, let's not be scattered. So the Lord confused their language and different family groups went to different parts of the world, taking a particular gene pool with them. And that's what dominates in that area. It actually makes sense. Now I'm going to look at this in more detail because the issue of racism is bad. It's terrible. In fact, I hopped on the internet and I said, okay, what kind of racist acts are out there? Boy, you type that in the internet, it's all over the place. There's headlines everywhere. You can see all sorts. There was a, 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 a killer recently went into Kroger, and they, that's a, apparently a, a racist uh, individual that went in there for that purpose. We see all sorts of different things. I could have put thousands of headlines up here. That's how bad it is just here in the United States. You look across the Western world, we see just as many problems. When I was in Australia, I saw forms of racism. When I was in Sweden, I saw forms of racism. There's a lot. 
It's all over the place. But let's look back into the past, because we've seen a lot of racist acts back in the past as well. Many of us sitting in this room could probably name specific instances where somebody had been racist to us. And in many cases, there may have been times when we were racist to someone else. Sometimes we may not have even realized it. But consider an individual here named Odabinga. He was from Africa. He was a pygmy. You know what they did to him? They actually put him on display in the zoo. Locked him up with the orangutans. Put him on display. Hey, look at this guy. He's like an animal. I'll tell you what, that played on him. Ultimately, Christian sought and got him, got him released, but he ended up killing himself. What about the Nazis? You go back to Germany, World War II, and even the precursor times leading up to that. They had a breeding program that they called Lebensborn. With Lebensborn, essentially they were trying to breed a master race. They did forced sterilization. Sometimes married people were forced to have children with people that they viewed as being higher on the evolutionary scale. I mean, you got to understand the way the Nazis were thinking. They were thinking in terms of an evolution, millions of years uh, type of a worldview. And with that, they said, okay, Darwin taught that people evolved out of Africa from lower apes. And so apes had darker skin, so they viewed lighter skin as being more evolved. Apes, they said, had a lot of hair, so less hair was more evolved. Apes had dark hair, so maybe blonde hair was more evolved. Apes had dark eyes, so maybe big blue eyes were more evolved. Light complexion things. I always wonder, what were they shooting for? <laughs> as sad as this is, Beavis and Homer Simpson fit the category. As terrible as that is. <laughs> you see, that was the way that they were thinking. They attacked Jews. They attacked Poles, Slavs. Africans, they've attacked all sorts of people. But what else did that philosophy lead to? Do you realize that an evolutionary worldview even led to graves being desecrated by Australian Aborigines? There were even instances where they were hunted and their bodies were put on display in museums around the world. It's terrible to see these types of atrocities. If somebody isn't outraged at these types of things, uh, then there's something wrong with them. These things were terrible atrocities. Now I want to step back and I want to look at this issue. And I want to look at it from a big picture. Big picture here. Either God's right or he's not. Let me ask you, is God right? God is always right. And when God says that we all go back to Adam and Eve, Adam was the first man, Eve is the mother of all the living, there is one race. But if you reject God and his word, by default, man becomes the authority. And when you reject God, anything goes. Now, I want to encourage you to start with the Bible. Let the Bible be the absolute authority at everything you look at, even when it's looking at other people. You see, if we go back to the early pages of the Bible, do you realize man was created supernaturally and unique? We're not like animals, not even close. Genesis 2-7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Yeah, our bodies are made from dust. That's why it can return to dust once we sin. But you see, God made our bodies, but where did the life come from? It came from God. God breathed life into us. You see, we as mankind, we are made in the image of God. Then the woman was made from the rib, from the side, from Adam. Genesis 2.22, then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. See, man and woman, we are both made in the image of God. We were both made supernaturally and unique. Hey, is this too hard for an all-powerful God to do this? No, this is all too easy. I've had people say, well, Eve should have been a clone if she came from Adam. No, this is God we're talking about. This isn't a problem, okay? But I've had people say, but Bodie, we're in a culture. Look around. We see all these people who are red and yellow and black and white. Why are we conditioned to look at that? I've had people come up to me and say, hey, Bodie, you're a white person. No, 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 no. I don't know if you guys have seen anything that's white. Here, let me show you something that's white. We got all sorts of things that are white, and I don't know if you can see this up here. I'm going to try to pull it off so you can see it just a little bit better, and I'll show you what, what white looks like. Ready? Ready? Well, almost ready. Almost ready. Technology, I'm telling you. Ah, this is white. Now I'm going to put this up to my skin. You tell me, am I white? Am I even close to that color? No, I'm not. If I look like that, call a hearse. Ambulance isn't going to help. It's all over with. 
No, I'm kind of brownish. In fact, we're all kind of brownish. Some are more brown, some are less brown. It's not a big deal. When you start with Scripture, it makes sense of that. You see, we see this variation in different people. That's not a big deal. God loves that variety. But you see, when you reject God and his word, people start looking at this variety from an entirely different viewpoint. So why, why do some people look darker? Why do some people look lighter? Why do we see variations in people? It actually goes back to our DNA. DNA does not stand for the National Dyslexia Association. <laughs> yeah, some of you guys got that right off the bat. Come on, we got to have a little fun with this. It's a tough subject. We can still have some fun with it. Deoxyribonucleic acid. It's actually a fascinating code system that codes for the way our whole bodies are built. It's got an incredible amount of information in it. So much information in the human genome. Our DNA is made up of about 3 billion base pairs. Now, what that equates to, if you count this as information, about 1,000 books of 500 pages of information. That's an incredible amount of information. I love looking at this kind of stuff. But, but what our DNA codes for are things like skin shape, eye shape, eye color, hair amount, hair color. I got the genetics that causes my hair to fall out on my head. It starts to grow on my back. I don't get that one. But apparently, I've got the genetics for that. But let's just get an idea of how much information is contained in that genome. If any two people, male and female, had a child, how many different children can they have that won't be identical by, by getting information from mom and dad. Not necessarily identical twins or triplets where it's the same DNA that splits. You know how many it would be? 10 to the power of 2017. This, you can't even imagine that number. This is a 10 with 2017 zeros after. It's tough to even imagine that. Now let me give you a comparison. The estimated number of atoms in the entire known universe is somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to the power 80th. I tell you what, that gives you a taste of the mind of God, doesn't it? when he created mankind. But you see, we see variations in people, and that's not a big deal. That's a lovely thing. That's a lovely thing. But you know, if we look at, say, animals, we see variation in animals too, don't we? We see variation in plants and a lot of different things. Do you realize when God created things in Genesis chapter 1, he said he created them after their kind or according to their kind? Hey, let me ask you, do animals change? Yeah, they change. Like, like you guys like dogs? Yeah, you guys like dogs, that's right. Do you guys like cats? <laughs> Not so much. Okay, we're going to stick with the dogs in this example. I mean, we see a variation of dogs up here on our screen. If you start the far left, you got this wolf-like creature. That's a pretty dog. That's a shaggy dog, that third one. The next one in, that's an ugly dog. That, that's a cute dog. That's a really ugly dog. And, well, that's a dog. It looks like a rat. But it's a dog. <laughs> but you see, you see, these are all dogs. These are just variations in these dogs, right? Do you realize that all these dogs can ultimately interbreed with each other? They're part of the one dog kind. That's what we like to say. Here's a number of different uh, domesticated dogs. We've got a variety of those, more domesticated dogs. All the domestic dogs are actually classed as one species. And yet, look at the variation we see just in those. So how is it that we get all this variation within dogs all around the world? Let's think about this. Let's go back into the past. Noah comes off the ark, and he has two of each kind on board the ark, right? Of the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. He has two dogs on board the ark. These two dogs come off the ark, and they fall in love and get married. Now, I'm going to teach you some genetics. Now, now, don't let me scare you with this. It's actually a lot more complicated than this, but let, let me explain it like this. Let's say these two dogs have medium-length fur. And let's say that they have the genes for long hair and short hair in there. And let's say that when those two are together, that expresses medium length fur. Now, like I said, it is more complicated than this. But let's say they get married and they have babies. What kind of babies can they have? Well, they can actually have babies have short hair fur because they get the short hair gene from mom and the short hair gene from dad. Or they can have others with medium length fur where they get a long hair and a short hair from either mom or dad. They can even have babies that have all long hair because they get a long hair gene from mom and a long hair gene from dad. So all of a sudden, in one generation, you can have dogs with long hair, medium length fur, or short hair, all right there in one generation. Now, these dogs come off the ark, and you know, if you know anything about dogs, dogs have more dogs. And dogs have more dogs, and they have more dogs. If you know anything about dogs, you end up with lots of dogs. Not to be confused with hot dogs, you can eat hot dogs. I don't know if you want to eat hot dogs. Because if you know what's in a hot dog, you may not want to eat that. But either way, you're going to get lots of dogs. And dogs like to eat hot dogs, too, just so you know. Whew. Good thing I don't have to say that twice. 
but you end up with lots of dogs. Now, dogs start to go to different parts of the world. Now, some parts of the world get hot. Some parts of the world get cold. You go up north. It gets cold up north. Okay, so the dogs that go up north, it gets cold up there. So do you think the dogs with short fur like that? No, they don't like that. In fact, what ends up happening, let's say you get some dogs go up to the far north, the dogs that like that are the dogs with the long fur. They can survive in that real easy. The dogs with short fur or medium length fur, they're either going to move away or die off. So you're only going to be left with a population of dogs with long-haired fur up north. Okay? Same sort of thing if the dogs go to a place that becomes a Sahara desert. It starts to get hot. <laughs> Uh, the dogs with shorter fur, they actually prefer that. The dogs with long hair fur, they don't like that. They're going to move away or die off. So you're going to be left with a population of dogs that only have short fur. See how you get the variation as animals go to various parts of the world. It's actually not that big of a deal. We see variations. But I want you to notice these dogs don't change into cats. They don't change into elephants or dinosaurs. They don't change into anything. These are dogs, and you see a variation in the dogs. Dingoes, for example, have lost the information for long hair. Collies here have lost the information for short hair, but they're still all dogs. Chihuahuas lost a lot of information. <laughs> Those poor things. They're so ugly, people put clothes on them in Hollywood. <laughs> Just picking on the chihuahuas here. But I want you to notice, these types of variations are not evolutionary changes, okay? These are just dogs changing into dogs. You see, in an evolutionary worldview, let's just go back. In an evolutionary worldview, if you start with some sort of single-celled organism like an amoeba, and it's going to evolve all the way up into a dog up here, you're going to have to add new information to its genome. You need to add information for hair. You need to add information for a brain, add information for a circulatory system and a nervous system and so forth. Those are not the changes we observe. What we observe are variations within the dogs. Dogs changing into dogs. That's what we call a horizontal variation, not a vertical variation. We see this of other creatures, not just dogs. We see variations in chickens. And even these, these are some of the domestic chickens. Some of these are really, I've seen some of these real Transylvanian naked neck chickens. They are ugly. Oh, ugly looking chickens. But you know, some of these chickens can actually interbreed with things like pheasants and with turkeys and things. They're all part of that fowl kind. So you see variations in this sort of thing. Same sort of thing with horses. Here's a number of our domesticated horses, but they can actually breed with things like donkeys and with things like zebras and so forth. You see variation within this horse kind. It's not a big deal. So when we look at people, we need to think along the same lines. Same but different. You see, when it came to the dogs, the environment affected them. When they went to a cold place, it affected them. Humans are a little different. We defy the natural elements, don't we? It gets cold, what do we do? Put clothes on. Build a fire, build a house. You see, we can defy that sort of thing. But people still get divvied up to different parts of the world according to the Tower of Babel. And that explains that a little bit more. But, you know, I've heard people say, but, but what about the skin tones themselves? Red and yellow and black and white. Doesn't that remind you of a little kid's song? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Do you realize there's kids around the world singing that a little different? They're singing shades of brown from dark to light, they are precious in his sight. Do you realize that's actually more accurate? And here's why. Let me explain this. You know, there's a pigment in our skin. There's, a, there's actually a couple, but one of the main ones is one called melanin. It's a brownish pigment that appears in your skin. And if your genes say produce more of this, you're going to be darker on the scale. If your genes say produce a little bit less of it, you're going to be lighter on the scale. Now, this Im image actually came from National Geographic. They lined up a bunch of girls in a classroom just to show you it's one color. It's just how much is there. Do you have more of this melanin color? Do you have less of this? See, we're not usually taught to look at things like this. I think this was brilliant research that they did, just lining these guys up. You see, I probably sit somewhere in here. And then after summer, I'm somewhere in here. I move over a little bit. You know how sound affects that too. But you see, this goes back to our genetics. Now I'm going to put a little bit more genetics out there. And of course, it's even more complicated than this too. But let's say that we have two parents up here that have capital A, small a, capital B, small b. Now, I'm, I'm like, oh boy, I'm throwing some big stuff out here. Let's say the capital A and the capital B stand for produce lots of melanin. Let's say the small a and the small b say, well, let's produce smaller amounts of melanin. So let's say, how many different children can they have? Well, you can have children who are really dark where they get the capital A's and the capital B's from both mom and dad. 
or children who are really light, small a, small b down here on the lower right, to produce very little bits of melanin. You can see the variation all the way through here. Now, it's even more complicated than this, of course. But look, notice, you can get people who are really dark to really light in one generation. I've had people say, no, no, that takes thousands of years. You've got to be kidding me. That, uh-uh, not at all. Oh, yeah, it can happen. It really can happen. I want you to take a look at these uh, hoarder twins. Just, just absolutely beautiful. Here they are as children. Here they are kind of grown up a little bit more. But both of these parents had a light and a dark parent. And so they actually came out kind of middle brown. And look at those beautiful twins. Dark hair, dark skin, dark eyes, blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin. It's twins right there. You know what? We see a lot of examples of this. Uh, here's a, a couple of girls, uh, Grant uh, twins. They had a... Uh, Father, who was Jamaican, and their mother was English. Here's another set. Mixed doubles. Another set. Here, uh, um, the mother was a mix between English and Nigerian, and the father was English. Look at those little twins. Ryan and Leo, look at those cute little kids. A German father and an a African mother from Ghana. Oh, I love this one. Twin Credibles. Two sets of two-tone twins. How cool is that, right? Absolutely beautiful. Oh, I just love seeing things like this. But notice, this is just a variation in your genetics. Produce more melanin, produce less melanin. Hey, it's something very similar with your, with your eye color, too. More melanin versus less melanin. Of course, you can get variations all throughout there. And, I, you know, I, I'm blown away by this kind of stuff. But you see, if you go back to the genetics, we have variations even in our eye shape because of our genetics. You know, we can look at piece after piece of humans and why we look a little bit different, but it goes back to our genetic makeup. That's what it is. Biologically, I want you to understand, biologically, there is one race, the human race. That's what it is. Well, why is racism so prevalent in our culture today? I mean, if people were starting with the Bible saying, hey, we all go back to Adam and Eve, we're all related, should there be racism? Nope. In fact, when we get to heaven, there isn't going to be any racism. Amen, right? That's something to look forward to. But we're not in heaven. Instead, we're in a sin, cursed, and broken world where a lot of false ideas become popular. Consider this one. The evolution of man. We've been drilled with this one. I've been drilled with this left and right. Tell me if you've ever heard this story. Man evolved out of Africa from a lower ape. Man was not very smart, kind of like a dumb brute. Finally, we got smart enough that, that we could actually start planting our own crops instead of being a hunter and gatherer. Finally, you get smart enough to, to start producing real good crops, and, and then you, you get smart enough to say, you know what, let's just stay here and build our own shelter. It's kind of rudimentary at first. Finally, you get smart enough, you could, you could build fancier houses or at least fancier shelters. Then, then you get to a point where you can develop your own civilizations like Indus Valley, Mesopotamia, or Egypt, places like that. I heard that over and over again. Do you know what? Ancient historians don't mention anything of the sort. We don't see that from ancient historians. That is a brand new, rewritten history that has been imposed upon generations of people. Darwin was the first one to propose that man evolved out of Africa. He proposed that in his book, The Descent of Man, because that's where you find the apes, and he believed we evolved from apes. Totally in contrary to what God says in his word. This philosophy goes all the way back to an alleged Big Bang. Essentially, there was nothing. No time, no space, nothing at all. Something pops into existence from nothing, rapidly explodes or expands. They claim that happened anywhere from about 13 to 15 billion years ago. And then you have the evolution of the universe. Finally, we get the first life in here where you have what's called chemical evolution, where chemicals come together and form the first life, and it evolves further and further to where you finally get people. And you know what they taught a lot of these early evolutionists? They taught, well, some people are more evolved than others. This is what Darwin taught. And they, they had a multitude of races, but usually what a lot of these early evolutionists had was four different races. Now, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't like these terms, I don't like saying it, but this is what they had. They had the Caucasoid, or the Caucasian, the Mongoloid, the Negroid, and the Australoid. And they actually went so far as to rank them. They put the Caucasians on top, and they put the Australian Aborigines at the bottom. Can you see why their graves were desecrated and they were hunted? Because people were looking at them as though they were some sort of missing link. Oh, I hate, hate this type of terminology. In fact, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to just get rid of the term races. Just throw it in the trash. Toss it out. Let it be gone. Because we have different people groups, different family groups in various parts of the world. Nevertheless, a lot of these early evolutionists, they were really teaching that there were higher and lower races. One of the uh, early evolutionists, 
Uh, he was a German man named Ernst Haeckel. He wrote a book called The History of Creation, popularized an evolutionary worldview to the German people, which ultimately led to Nazism. There's a big connection in there. But look what he says here. He says, at the lowest stage of human mental development are the Australians, some tribes of the Polynesians, and the Bushmen, the Hottentots, and some of the Negro tribes. Let me ask you, would something like that fuel racism? Yes, it would. Where'd he get this idea? He got it from Charles Darwin himself in his book, The Descent of Man. Charles Darwin says, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphic apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will then intervene between man and a, and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian Aborigine and the gorilla. You know what Darwin's saying here? The Caucasians are on top and they should wipe out everyone else. Sadly, the Nazis tried to do that sort of thing and there's other people still trying to promote these types of terrible ideas. But you can see why the Australian Aborigines were hunted. Their graves were desecrated and all sorts of terrible atrocities occurred with them. Now, I want you to understand something. I want to throw a caveat out there. Evolution is not the cause of racism. Racism was around long before that. But once people started to buy into an evolutionary worldview, it just exploded because it was inherently a racist philosophy. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, he was a former professor at uh, Harvard University, he died a few years back. He says, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. You see, they actually fit very well together. I've had people say, but Bodie, aren't there all these missing links that prove evolution? No, not at all. Let me explain that for just a moment. Let me drop into that. There's three ways people try to make a missing link, three. One, you take bones of a human, you take bones of an ape, and you try to build a missing link. But is that even a real creature? No, because you got bones of human and bones of a, that's not even a real creature. You're just trying to you know, make a Lego building of some sort you know, with those bones. The second way to try to make a missing link is you take an ape and you try to make it look like a human. And we see instances of that. Uh, Lucy, for example, Australopithecine afarensis, that's just a, an ape, a variant form of chimpanzee. And what do they do? They try to make it look as human-like as possible, make it stand up in museums uh, almost as tall as me, uh, make it, give it human hands and feet and human eyes and things like that. They're taking an ape, trying to make it look like a human. And of course, the third way to make a missing link is you take a human and you try to make it look like an ape. That's a great case with Neanderthal. Neanderthal's a human. Wore clothes, they made musical instruments, they worshiped, uh, you know, they were clearly human. All the features of a Neanderthal are within the human population even today. But what do you see in a lot of the artist's illustrations is they take this human, they try to put ape-like features on it. Now there's a lot of defunct missing links and things like that floating around out there. Here's just a handful that may pop up in the news. And I know uh, some of these uh, may be difficult for you to read. Uh, but Neanderthals right up here at the top, what is it? We just break it down, it's a human. What you're typically finding are humans and apes. You know, in some cases you find some extinct apes and whatnot. Sometimes you have a junk category where they take some of the human bones and some of the ape bones and put it together. In some cases, they're so desperate to find missing links, like Ida down here, it's a lemur. Huh, I'm telling you, people really want their missing links. But we just need to step back and realize there's one race, the human race. And when it comes to missing links, there's a reason they're called missing links, because they're missing. They're not there. Well, friends, I want to encourage you, if you want to find out more about the subject of racism, particularly in our culture, some of the scientific problems with it, this is an incredible book, One Race, One Blood. It's by Ken Ham, the founder of the, of the Ministry of uh, Answers in Genesis. He's the CEO of the ministry. And Dr. Charles Ware, uh, he's an African-American who uh, actually as a president of Crossroads Bible College. And, you know, he deals with a lot of the cultural issues of this powerful book. And I want to encourage you to consider that one. But how does all this stuff relate to Babel? You know, I mentioned it earlier. You know, we have the, the splitting apart of the different family groups, the languages as people go to different parts. Well, let's dive into that in a little bit more detail. Because historically, this just destroys that idea of the mythology. 
Remember how I said this? After the Tower of Babel, different people groups go to different parts of the world. They take a gene pool with them. Let me explain it like this. People who went to uh, Australia, like the Australian Aborigines, they took genes for darker skin. People who went to uh, the Orient, places like Japan, they took genes for an almond-shaped eye. People who went to Europe took genes for lighter skin, like the people you see in Sweden and so forth. But remember, we're all related. We just have that variation, whether it's the melanin, whether it's the eye shape, whether it's the eye color and so forth. Now, I'm going to put a slide up here, and I just, this is one of my favorite slides that I've, that I've ever been involved with. Now, you can hardly read it. I know. Some of you guys <laughs> can't. But uh, what this is, this is after the flood. You have Noah right up here at the very top, and then you have his three uh, sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. Now, what you're looking at on the rest of this slide is Genesis chapter 10. You know those genealogies you don't like to read because you can't pronounce the names? Yeah, this is one of them. And, and this is Noah's family. When you start to break it down, who are the sons? Who are the grandsons? The great-grandsons and great-great-grandsons and so forth. And in some cases, you have a listing here where you have some other sons and daughters. And we re uh, read about that in Genesis chapter 11. But I want you to understand something right now. Looking at that board, your direct ancestors are right up there right now. Look, Right there. They're up here. Whether you know who they are, they're right there. We all go back to Noah, right? Hey, we also go back to one of his sons. We also go back to one of his grandsons and so forth. So I love looking at this. Now, I look at this, and I love to study these people. Who were these different people? Who is Cush? Who is Mitrium? Who is Gomer? Golly! Shazam! You kids out there have no idea what I just did. You older people, you guys know. Kids, grandkids, ask your parents and grandparents about that one. Not the same Gomer, just so you know. But uh, let's dive into some of these different people groups, and let's look a little bit at the Tower of Babel, at its archaeology, at its structure, and languages and things like that. So let's dive into that. Do you realize we have what's called a uh, Tower of Babel steel or steely? I've heard people pronounce it. What this is, this is basically a rock. It's not made out of steel, just so you know. But it's a rock. It's a carving. See it here? And you've got the Tower of Babel, and you have Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar from the Bible is right there, uh, and, and, and he's uh, on here, and there's an inscription that he's looking at this old dilapidated tower in his day, which the Tower of Babel was long before his day and age. And uh, one of the things he wanted to do was actually tear it down and, and, and rebuild it, or at least uh, remodel it of some sort. So the Tower of Babel was most likely some sort of ziggurat uh, type of structure. A lot of uh, ancient towers in the Middle East and various parts of the world were actually uh, these step step pyramids or ziggurats is a fancy term for it. And as people went to different parts of the world, they took their building project with them. We find uh, uh, specialized ziggurats like pyramids in Egypt. We also find them in China. We find a number of different ziggurats all the way over uh, to the Americas here, uh, whether it's the mound builders building it out of dirt or whether the people in middle America that make some of these things like Chichen Itza and so forth. But we find these in various parts of the world. To me, that's a fascinating confirmation of the Tower of Babel. Well, what about the languages specifically? Do you realize we have over 7,000 well, uh, languages that came out of Babel? It's actually just a little bit under, but it depends on how they, how they label some of these languages because sometimes computer languages are actually denoted as languages and things like that too. Well, were there really that many people at the Tower of Babel, say 6,900 uh, spoken languages and so forth? Was, that, was there really that many people that came out of Babel? No. Remember, if we go back to this chart, if you tally up all these people, now I actually subtracted off Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and I subtracted off Peleg because what happened occurred in the days of Peleg. Was he old enough to get his own language? We don't know. But I went ahead and subtracted him anyway, and I added this up, and you get a minimum of about 78 uh, language families that came out of the Tower of Babel. So you'll see some sons and daughters here, sons and daughters. That's why I say a minimum, because there could have been some more. But that's just kind of a minimum number that we throw out there. So how do you get about 7,000 languages from about 78 language families? Let me tell you a little bit about English. English is different in different parts of the world, isn't it? You know, if you go up to Canada, take off, eh? So we're like, where did this language come from, right? You go to Tennessee, they speak a beautiful form of English. <laughs> You go down to Australia. My wife's from Australia. It's right, matey. Go get yourself some tucker down at the Billabong. Let's go get some food down by the swamp. That's I got to translate that English into English. Uh, you go over to England. It's different. You see, we have variations in English. The fact is, if you look at English going back into the past, and that's what I've done here. It's just the beginning part of Matthew 6, 9. Look at it as you go back. Boom, 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 boom. A thousand years ago, you can hardly read it. <laughs> 
Look at that. The old English down here, you can hardly read it. Do you realize that English is actually a Germanic language? And that almost looks like German, doesn't it? You see, that's a variation. English is classed as a Germanic language, but there's a number of Germanic languages. You have Austrian, for example. You have high and low German. You also have Norwegian and things like that, Dutch. These are variations in the German language family. There's also a Romance language family. Young men, that does, that's not the way you speak to a lady. <laughs> These are languages of Rome. That's what they are. So um, you have Latin, for example, or Italian. You have Romanian. You have Spanish and Portuguese and French. These are part of the Romance language family. So linguists have actually looked up these various language families, and they say, well, how many language families are there? Typically, I mean, their numbers tend to vary every year, but a lot of times the numbers that they throw out there are somewhere between 95 and 100 language families. Now, there are some new languages, some constructed languages like Esperanto, or you know, I even have a little code and things like that, and people come up with, with uh, computer languages. Sometimes those are lumped in, sometimes they're not. But uh, for legitimate language families, somewhere in the neighborhood of 95 to 100. Now, this number can actually go down. So we have a minimum of 78, a maximum of, say, 95 to 100. We're right in the ballpark, aren't we? That, to me, this is an incredible confirmation of Scripture. I mean, think of the secular world. In the secular world, they say you evolved out of Africa from dumb brute apes. <laughs> All of our fascinating languages came from stuff like that. Not buying it. This makes a lot of sense. And as people go to different parts of the world, the language families go, and it continues to vary and deviate, just like what we're seeing today. Hey, by what means do people travel from the Tower of Babel? Or Babel, Babel, Babel. Hey, how do you guys say that? Mostly Babel here. You know, when I was in England, it was only Babel. You know, it's fascinating. It goes show you can't even say the word Babel or Babel without having the Tower of Babel involved. I've always been fascinated by that. Hey, by what means do people travel? Do you think they went by boat? Yeah, it's possible. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they were expert shipbuilders. I'm sure they've passed that technology on. In Genesis chapter 10, it says, from these, the coastline, that's the island or the maritime peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands. Everyone according to his language, everyone uh, that is according to their families into their nations. So yeah, some of them could have went by boat. That makes sense. I mean, consider Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they lived a long time. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. Shem lived 500 years after the flood. They could have passed on all sorts of technologies, all sorts of history that occurred before uh, the flood, for example. Now, there was an experiment done. Back in 1969 and 1970, uh, these ships called Ra 1 and Ra 2, they were Egyptian-style reed boats, uh, kind of like what they had in ancient Egypt, but they were actually built by some of the people that were down in Peru because they built ships very similar. But uh, they built a couple of these. Uh, Ra 2, for example, set sail in 1970, and it uh, left Safi, Morocco, and it landed in Barbados in 57 days with supplies and everything. Goes to show that people could have transversed the Atlantic Ocean even with some of the simpler vessels uh, of the past. You know, it's interesting. If you look at the Olmec, they, they are precursors to the Mayans in Central America. They actually claim that they have came by boat from the east, from Africa, by an ancient Maya deity or legendary leader named Itzama. What's interesting is the Olmec are one of the few places in North and South America where they retained a written language. And for the longest time, people couldn't understand that language. They kept tying it in or trying to tie it into some of these tribes in North and South America. It just didn't match up. Finally, a person who was an expert in West African languages looks at it and says, well, I can read this. It was very similar to the languages in West Africa. Fascinating when you think about that. And you know what? If you look at some of the ocean currents, yeah, they could have easily traveled over this direction. That's kind of what happened with that uh, uh, Ra 2 ship when they did uh, uh, transverse the Atlantic Ocean. But look at this. People could have went all the way out and landed in Hawaii in different places. Yeah, they could have gone by boats. That's not a problem. Hey, do you think people could have walked to various parts of the world? You think they could have walked to the Americas or walked to Japan or walked to England? Hey, it's possible. Here's why. Most people, creationists and evolutionists, actually agree on something. They, they agree on an ice age. Now, creationists have one major ice age that was triggered by the flood of Noah's day. It was perfect conditions to do that. I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But in the secular world, they have a whole bunch of ice ages. They just go way back. But the point is, we agree on one. And what happens in an ice age is you take a lot of water out of the ocean and you put it on land. And what that does, when you take a lot of water out here and put it on land, it lowers your ocean uh, level, which exposes land bridges. Because some of this water 
is not very deep over some of these areas. You could have walked all the way up here from uh, Siberia all the way into Alaska and to North America because it would have been so shallow, a huge uh, land bridge up in there. Uh, you could have walked all the way out to the British Isles, for example, or all the way out to Japan, potentially all the way to Australia. And that's a little deeper down in here, but there is a lot of tectonic activity which shifts your uh, ocean floor as well. But yeah, a lot of animals could have tra traveled at this time. A lot of people may well have been able to get across these land bridges as well. Okay, well, what about all those people? This is the fun part of the talk, or the really boring part of the talk, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> you know, all these different people, where did they go to? Who were they? Who were the descendants of Tubal, for example? Now, I looked up different passages in the Bible that continued to talk about some of these people, which some of them are mentioned. Some of them are not mentioned at all. I also looked up uh, different histories and historians and ancient maps and uh, geographers. I even checked language families. There's even genetic studies that have been done on this. I even looked at some of the mythology and the oral tradition. Of course, I don't put near as much stock in things like that. But the point is the Bible is what's always true. And uh, then there's kind of a level of certain criteria here as well. Well, let's look. There was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Let's look at the descendants of Ham first. Ham had four sons listed at the Tower of Babel. Now, he could have had sons after the Tower of Babel, but this is who was listed. You have Mitzrayim, that's how that's pronounced, Put, Cush, and Canaan. All right? Well, let's just look at Cush. Cush actually had some descendants stay right there in the Tower of Babel area. That's where Nimrod was at. Some of them went out here. You have the Hindu Cush and traveled all the way down into India. Some of them came down here and settled in Arabia. Some of them went ahead and crossed over. A lot of the Ethiopians and people like that, they will still call themselves Cushites even today, uh, which is fascinating. If you look at Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim is a Hebrew name for Egypt. Every time you see Egypt in the Old Testament, the Hebrew behind that is Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is one of Noah's grandsons. So a lot of his descendants settled here. Some of them traveled all the way out. In between India and China, there's an area that still reflects his name called Mezaram, uh, which is kind of fascinating. Some of his descendants moved on over here and pushed uh, uh, people out. Uh, his uh, uh, son was uh, Libya Bos, or where, where the Lehabites or the Lubim came from. They're mentioned in Daniel, for example. That's where we get the name Libya, by the way. It's from one of Mitzrayim's sons. Uh, if you look at Put, Put came down and settled originally in uh, what we call Libya, but most of his descendants migrated out here to West Africa. Some of them went up and conquered Spain and Portugal for a time, a lot of the Moors. The Olmec would have came out of them because they shared the same language family and the, a lot of similar history and so forth. So they spread out throughout these particular areas. So if you just step back and look at three of the sons of Ham actually dominated these parts. A lot of the southern part of Africa is known as Lower Cush because a lot of the Cushites continued to descend down into that area. But it just kind of gives you an idea of a lot of it there. Now, one of the other sons of Ham was Canaan. And we know where the land of Canaan is. For those of you who've been to church and went to Sunday school, you guys are probably fairly familiar uh, with the land of Canaan. Now, a lot of the people in the land of Canaan were overthrown. Seven of the tribes there were overthrown by the Israelites who came in and they were judged for a lot of their sin. But I want you to notice one of the groups was called the Sinites. That's where the Sinai Peninsula, Mount Sinai, Wilderness of Sin, they're all named for that. Now, a lot of these Sinites actually migrated out, went all the way out to the land of China or Sinai. That, that's, that's, we actually see a reflection of the name. When the Chinese and Japanese went to war, it was the Sino-Japanese War. Well, they still use that terminology uh, even today. So there's a reflection there, and the Sinites dominated a lot of people groups out in the land of China. Now, if you turn toward Japheth, Japheth has typically been seen as the father of a lot of the European and the North Asian countries. Uh, you have Gomer, Magog, Madai, and I'm going to leave Madai off this list at first. Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. And there is a reason for that, by the way. Uh, but if you look at this, we have Gomer and one of his uh, sons, Ripvoth. Ripvoth kind of came up in here, settled in the northern part of what we call Asia Minor or Turkey today. And then he migrated on up into here. Some people think the name Europe actually comes from the name uh, Ripvoth. Your Ripvoth is uh, one of the variations that's thrown out there for that. Uh, we also have Gomer. Gomer came out here and settled in an area uh, which we now call France. Uh, it used to be known as Gaul or Galatia. Those are actually variant names of Gomer. The Gelts or the Celts, uh, the G's and C's were kind of interchanged. So a lot of the Celtic groups came directly out of Gomer. You have Galatia here, Galatia here, Galatia here. Some of these guys fought a war and came all the way back here and they got obliterated by the Greeks and that left a colony of Galatians here. Paul wrote to those Galatians in the New Testament. That's where that name comes from. But uh, the Welsh and a lot of the Celtic Caledonian areas 
were descendants of Gomer. The Welsh, the old language of, the, of Welsh was Gomerang, which is kind of fascinating when you look at that. Uh, even one of the groups, let me back up here, one of the groups that came out and settled in China and were actually dominated by the Sinites were the Mao or Mitzau people. They actually have a lineage that goes right back to Gomer, which is neat. Ashkenaz is one of Gomer's other sons. This is where the Germanic peoples came from. So most likely the Germanic language family came out of Ashkenaz. A lot of Jews that went up and settled in the land of Germany after 70 AD became known as the Ashkenazi Jews, Jews living in the land of Ashkenaz, for example. But the English, the Angles, the Saxons, the Danes, Norwegians, a lot of these people uh, came out of Ashkenaz here. Now, some of them are still mentioned that still live down in here. Initially, he lived right up in here and then they migrated up to Central Europe. Uh, one of uh, Gomer's other sons is Tagarma which is where a lot of the Turk groups came from, Turkmenistan and so forth. After the Byzantine Empire was waning and dying, the Turks came in and conquered them. And uh, we have the land known today as Turkey. So they ended up taking over Asia Minor and spread all the way up into Europe in these areas. Magog traveled north, settled in this particular area. A lot of the people north of the Black Sea were known as Scythians. That was the Greek name for Magog. Um, so, the, you know, after the Tower of Babel, some of these people come out with a multitude of names, and that actually makes sense. Uh, but a lot of the Slavic groups came out of Magog. Um, they he ended, ended up mixing with uh, Meshech, who I'm going to talk about here in just a moment. But what's interesting is some of Magog's descendants came out here and settled in Ireland and in Scotland. The, the Irish have three ancient lineages that go right back to one of the sons of Magog, and uh, the Scots have a lineage that go back to Magog as well, which is kind of neat. Uh, Meshech, he went farther north than where uh, Magog was, uh, settled a lot of North, uh, north Russia. Uh, think of Finland and Estonia and uh, Lat Latvia and Lithuania, some of those areas. Even some of the Huns came out of Meshech. And uh, the old name for Moscow, Russia, is actually a variation of Meshech in the Meshera Lowland. There's a Meshera State Park that are still out there that reflect that name. The Cappadocians, which are mentioned in Scripture, descendants. So you can see the direction by which they were heading. Uh, Javan. Every time you see Javan in the Old Testament, uh, we translate that as Greece. And there were four different sons, and each of them could have been known as Javan as well. But uh, Alexander the Great that came out of Macedonia, he would have been a descendant of Javan. Tarshish is one of those sons, and there's a couple of different places of Tarshish. Remember Jonah was trying to get to Tarshish? He was trying to get away from the Lord, and of course the Lord stopped him. Of course, some of them have uh, traveled into other parts of Europe as well. Tubal, uh, Tubal came up here, and he had descendants that went in two directions. One of them settled up here initially in Caucasian Iberia. Now, I throw that name Iberia out there because the Greek name for Tubal was Ibers. And so you see Caucasian Iberia. He came out here, and he settled in Tobolsk. Uh, Tubal uh, River is still up there. That area has been known as Tubal. And it, it's also known as Siberia. Drop the S. You see the Iberia. See how that kind of reflects in there? Uh, some of his descendants came out here and settled in the Iberian Peninsula, which is where Spain and Portugal are. Some of the Castilian people in Spain, some of them went as far as uh, Great Britain. Uh, Tyrus came up here and settled in this area. Thrace, Tyrus, it, it all kind of goes together there. We have the Tyrus River. Uh, of course, they've changed that name since that time, but the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea, the Etruscans, Tyrus and all, uh, some of these people came out here. Here's something interesting, and this might blow your mind. But 10 of the islands down here that was owned by Thrace in the Aegean Sea are the same names as 10 of the Native American tribes over here uh, in the Americas, which is just fascinating when you look at that. So some of these guys really have traveled pretty far. The Anacotti, particularly in Scotland, uh, would go back uh, to Tyrus. May have been some of those guys that kept going on over. Uh, if you look at Shem, uh, Shem had five sons listed at the Tower of Babel. Of course, you know, any of these guys could have had sons after the Tower of Babel. But uh, remember how I said I saved Madai here for a reason, because the Medes and the Elamites essentially kind of mixed together. The Medes were in the northern part of what we call Persia or Iran today. The southern part, you had the Persians, and they intermixed with the Elamites, uh, which are descendants of Shem. They mixed together. You have the Medes and the Persians. The Bible talks a lot about the law of the Medes of the Persians. We read that in secular history as well. Some of the guys, guys went as far out as India and some of those particular areas out there as well. So if you continue forward, Asher is where the Assyrians came from. One of their groups went as far into China. Uh, Arxfaxid, this is where the lineage of Christ comes from. You might think of Abraham being called of Ur of the Chaldeans here. We well, had Midian and Zimran and Joktan and 
uh, several different descendants, even Israel and Edom. These guys were all descendants of Abraham, uh, just to give you a taste and a touch of that. They dominated a lot of places, particularly in the Middle East. Lod or Lud uh, went and settled the southern part of Asia Minor or Turkey. Now, that language, we think, has gone extinct. Um, Strabo, who was a geographer about 2,000 years ago, he says he only knew of one city that still spoke the Lydian language. So it was on the verge of extinction back then. Uh, we have copies of it, and there have been people trying to decipher it even today. They've been uh, making some pretty good headway from what I understand. Uh, Aram, uh, this is where a lot of the Arameans came from, the Armenians and Mash and Gether and Bactria, some of these areas here. Even Carthage that fought against Rome are descendants of Aram. Uh, if you keep going, I, now I put Abraham in here. Even though Abraham was not at the Tower of Babel, I wanted to, you know, bless be Abraham. I mean, look at all these places that were dominated by Abraham's uh, uh, children. They dominated much of the Arabian Peninsula, a lot of places here in the Middle East. Even all the way out here, one of Abraham's grandsons, who's mentioned in Genesis 25, was Ephor. And uh, Ephor uh, teamed up with the Greeks, fought against the Libyans, and won, and ended up migrating out there. Um, at least their descendants did. And you know what? That's where the name Africa comes from. Aphra, the land of Aphra is where that name actually comes from. It's actually named for one of Abraham's uh, grandsons, which is just fascinating. But uh, you can see how Abraham really did become the father of many nations and many kings came out of him. Now, let's just step back. Whoosh. Oh, this is tough to look at, isn't it? You can see how Cush went down in here, Put was in here. Uh, you have a number of different descendants that just keep going. And we can trace a number of the people in China, some of the... Uh, uh, Japheth's descendants continued on up here, went all the way over to the Americas. It's fascinating when you step back and look at all this. I'm not going to comment on every bit of it. But where it gets tough is when you get to places like Australia, which we think we've been able to map, uh, particularly uh, Cush's son Seba, to a lot of the Australian Aborigines. But you start to get over to places like the Americas. You know, where did they come from? Because a lot of these guys, they didn't record uh, a, a written language any longer by the time they made it to the Americas because of wars, devastation, uh, and their travels and so forth. But I've been able to trace a number of the descendants of Noah, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Tyrus, the Sinites, uh, Put, Seba, Jockton, and I'm sure there's plenty of others that made it over to the Americas. But it's just fascinating to see how these guys can continue uh, traveling to various parts of the world. Are you guys tired of looking at maps? <laughs> I get tired of looking at the maps. But is that fascinating or what? Looking at historical records, looking at what the Bible says, we can actually match up a lot of these people. If you guys know anything about your ancestry, you may have seen some of the connections up here, which is uh, just, just mind-boggling sometimes. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time, but I do want to talk about a few other things. You know, I put a slide up earlier that talked that had some of these great ages of people. Remember, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. Shem lived 500 years after the flood. And we started to see a decrease of ages. And uh, you can see this decrease right down through here, okay? Noah and Shem actually outlived a lot of their own descendants. Now, this is significant. I've had people say, well, why did they decrease in age? And I've had some people say, well, maybe it was a diet change because you can start to eat meat after the flood. Uh, increased oxygen, environmental changes. And there may be small factors to this, but, you know, people have been uh, vegetarian their whole life. They don't live 900 years old like people were living before the flood. So there's definitely something going on. More than likely, it is a genetic bottleneck at the flood and at uh, the Tower of Babel. And there may be more factors behind this. There may be some anatomical reasons for it as well. Um, mutations and things like that actually do start to occur once Adam and Eve sin. And so there may be a number of factors in here. But uh, if you just look at the three generations after Shem here, who was born before the flood, you have three generations where they were living here pretty close to each other, about 445 years. And then all of a sudden at the Tower of Babel, boom, you see everything shift, and all of a sudden they, they suddenly drop, and you have three generations here where people are averaging only about 236 years. And uh, I mean, just try to imagine trying to get a job in those days. 125 years experience, oh, too bad. I only have 96, I'm still not qualified. <sighs> Got to throw some fun out there. Actually, there may be more to this than, than we may realize, too. But I still think it has to do with the genetic factors, because Shem was actually born before the flood, and yet he only lived 600 years. His grandpa, Noah's father, only lived 777 years, which is almost 200 years less than his father, Methuselah. So there may be some other factors in there. But here's why all this is significant. Do you realize cultures around the world had what's called ancestor worship? The Greeks did it. The Egyptians did it, the Romans did it, the Japanese did it, the Germans did it. A lot of these people, they elevated their ancestors to a godlike status and almost worshipped them. Now, think about why is this the case? 
Now, remember how Noah lived 350 years after the flood? Um, Shem lived 500 years after the flood. They outlived a lot of their great, 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 great grandchildren. Do you think people look at their ancestors different at that point? I mean, if I looked at, at my great, great, great grandpa and he looks fit as a fiddle and I'm about to die, I'd be like, is this guy mortal? Is he going to just keep going? You, do you realize if you look at a lot of these cultures, when they looked at their ancestors, uh, they called them immortals or gods with a small g, they still died. They just outlived everyone else. But that actually makes sense in light of what happened with the decline in those particular ages. So it actually explains why there are people who started to do ancestor worship. Not that that was the right thing to do. There's only one God, uh, the Lord God, the creator uh, and savior, Jesus Christ. But it explains that aspect of history. Were there any extra biblical accounts of a language split? Actually, there's quite a few. Um, I've documented about 30 or so, but there's actually quite a few. I just stopped looking. But uh, here's just a handful, and we find them all over the world. I'll just show you a couple of these before I close. Plato, uh, who was a Greek, uh, writing in his book, Critias. In the days of old, the gods, remember the gods, the people who outlived everybody else but still died, had the whole earth distributed among them by allotment. There was no quarreling, for you cannot rightly suppose that the gods did not know what was proper for each of them to have, or knowing this, that they would seek to procure for themselves by contention that which more properly belonged to others. Uh, here's another one. Uh, the Maidu Indians of California, uh, they said that everybody spoke the same language until during preparations for a special burning ceremony, when suddenly in the night, everyone began to speak a different tongue, except that each husband and wife talked the same language. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> you know, I, I love that because it really was their family group split apart. The husband and wife did retain the same language. Now, boy, wouldn't it be great in today's culture if we could, you know, speak to our wife and we just totally understand each other? I say that tongue in cheek. It's meant for fun. Uh, but uh, my wife and I, we have a great time with this. But uh, to close it out, I, I want to say this. Let's not miss Christ at, at Babel. You know, I can talk a lot about the Tower of Babel. I can talk a lot about what's going on with racism, but let's not miss Christ because that's what this is all about. We're not just here to talk about uh, Genesis or the Tower of Babel or the people groups. I want to see people one to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, when I look at this account in Genesis eleven seven, 7, there's a fascinating statement. Let us go down and confuse their language. Uh, notice the us in here. That's actually a reflection of the language all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. Let us make man in our image. That is a reflection of the triune God right there. Christ is intimately involved in this account right there. It's just fascinating. Even the word used here, Lord, that's a, a variation of the word I am. It's, it, it's, it's just incredible. Um, we, we find out a little bit more. The, the word is Jehovah. That's where that name comes from. It's I am. That's actually a variation of the name revealed to Moses in Exodus 3.14. I am who I am. That's where that name Jehovah comes from. Jesus used that in John 8.58. Before Abraham was, I am. He was claiming to be God right there. See, notice that even the terminology, Christ is right there intimately involved. And what about the judgment here? People were being disobedient to God. They were trying to defy God. They didn't want to scatter. They didn't want to go fill the earth. They tried to build a city and a tower to defy God. It's right there in Genesis 11:4. You know, the people not too long before that were trying to defy God as well. They were extremely violent, wicked, evil. And the Lord sent a global flood to demolish and annihilate everyone, except for those who were on board the ark. This was actually quite a mild judgment, wasn't it? Confuse their language and scatter them abroad over the face of the whole earth. You see the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right there. You see, friends, we are of one blood. All of us, everyone in this room, no matter what we look like, we are of one blood. But there's one person's blood who is more important than all that. That is the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The punishment from an infinite God is an infinite punishment. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is infinite, he stepped into history to die in our place for our sin. That is a loving God. The infinite Son took the infinite punishment from the infinite Father, and that was enough to satisfy God's wrath upon sin. And that's what makes salvation possible for anyone. Doesn't matter how many steps away from God you've taken, it's only one step back. Thank you, guys.